please uh, welcome Chris Fossick, the Managing Director of Southeast Asia of Jones Lang LaSalle. Uh, thank you, Richard, and thank you to the CEO Forum for inviting me here today, and thank you all for uh, getting up early. Our, our talk this morning, or, or, or the talk I'd like to sort of uh, give you this morning, is um, focused on the real estate market, uh, and it's focused in particularly on the ASEAN region, uh, which uh, the Philippines, as you know, uh, is a part of that. Um, and I've also uh, got a little bit on the sort of broader Asia-Pacific markets. Um, but I, I thought I would sort of start off, uh, if I may, uh, covering sort of ASEAN uh, and you know what's happening in ASEAN and what implications we see uh, opportunities for the real estate industry. And then actually do a little bit of a, an update and summary on the real estate industry after that. Uh, and then my local colleagues, um, we've got a great team here in the Philippines, uh, have put together a little bit of information on the BPO industry for me, of which I'm not an expert, they are. Um, and I'll try to do my best in presenting um, some facts about the, the BPO industry. Um, but I, I'd like to start by, by saying from a real estate perspective, um, and a, a, somebody that's involved in the commercial real estate, which JLL are, um, the, you know, the market and the conditions have almost never been better. Uh, we've seen a, a big recovery uh, since the global financial crisis. Um, and there's huge momentum now in the commercial real estate markets in many of the cities and countries around the world. Uh, office rents, commercial rents are rising uh, in many of the cities. Um, there's attractive returns in real estate. Uh, I think with the lower interest rates that we've seen around the world since the global financial crisis, real estate has really come into being. Uh, and you've got large funds, whether you know they're pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, etc., allocating more and more money to real estate. Uh, and why? Because real estate is providing almost the highest returns uh, of investments uh, in any segment uh, in, in the world at the moment. Uh, and because of that, uh, you know, we see continued interest. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a wall of capital. Um, but you know, there is almost not a place um, right now in the world where uh, there's not more capital and there are opportunities to invest. Now, of course, that, that can be in some ways a worrying, um, a worrying moment, but um, I think if you look at some of the metrics around the real estate market today, uh, we don't see the bubble metrics that we saw uh, in most of the markets uh, prior to the global financial crisis. And I'll touch on those uh, in a, a little bit longer, in a little bit later. In terms of JLL, uh, we've been here in the Philippines uh, since 1997. Uh, it, it, it's a tremendous business for us. Uh, we've grown tenfold in the last 10 years. Um, and we grow if our clients are doing well and the real estate industries are doing well. Um, we've got 500 people here in the Philippines. Uh, and globally, uh, strategically, it's a very important place because a huge amount of our clients around the world have operations here in the Philippines. Whether they are operators of BPO services or whether they're companies receiving the services of those companies. Um, so the Philippines comes up in discussion all over the world with hundreds of our clients every month uh, of the year. So for us, um, it's a very strategic market now. Uh, and one that we must you know, continue to expand in so that we can service our, our clients. So if I can sort of just start um, with, the, with the presentation. Um, and I just thought a sort of introduction. Uh, and um, I just thought I would sort of you know, confirm probably what you already know, that uh, the population in ASEAN is about 8% of the total global population. So it's a big area. Um, and certainly one uh, that most you know, companies uh, have on their agenda in terms of their sort of investment strategy. It's a very sort of diverse uh, nation or diverse region. Uh, there's 10 nations, uh, and I think flying around all of those nations, I think it probably is about a sort of four hour uh, journey uh, between uh, the furthest and closest ones. The diversity, though, you can see here um, is very varied. Um, so if you look at the size of the economies, the largest economy in ASEAN uh, is Indonesia. Uh, that makes up about 40% of the economy, almost $1 trillion, all the way down to Laos uh, being the smallest one. 
uh, and I've highlighted the Philippines here uh, in red. The GDP per capita uh, you know, ranges from at the top end 51,000 for Singapore uh, all the way to um, 1,000 or, or 968 in Cambodia. So uh, there's a huge sort of variation there. Um, the GDP growth, uh, there's some variation there as well, but most of the, most of the countries you can see uh, are growing. Uh, and the population, uh, huge big sort of differences in the population. You've got the very small population of Singapore uh, and the very large population of Indonesia uh, and the Philippines there. And the economies are quite diverse as well. Uh, so bringing these countries together um, is not uh, necessarily the easiest uh, of things and that. The transparency uh, in the uh, different countries as well, and we, we we track as a company transparencies uh, of uh, different sort of countries. Uh, it's quite important because when investors come into the countries, uh, overseas investors, they want to know, you know, about sort of legal systems. They want to know about, you know, information. Uh, they want to know about, particularly when they're investing in real estate, um, what uh, is the ownership structure? What's the information out there in terms of what's happening in the marketplace? So, uh, you can see here. Uh, that we do every two years uh, a transparency uh, index where we look at these countries around the world um, and you can see some of the ASEAN countries here uh, and what has happened. But you can see the general trend is that the countries in ASEAN and Philippines in particular has gone from low transparency uh, in 2004 to now semi-transparency in 2014. Uh, that there's a gradual sort of uh, improvement. Now, why is this important in real estate? Uh, if we were to go to one of the sovereign wealth funds or uh, one of the pension funds or the endowment funds around the world, um, because they're investing money that doesn't belong to them but belongs to you know, their pensioners or uh, their members or their citizens, uh, then they're very concerned about risk. Uh, and they want to go to countries where there's the greatest transparency. Um, so they will look at sort of indexes like this that we produce to decide on uh, whether they make those investment decisions. Now, the countries with the highest transparency uh, in Asia Pacific are Australia and New Zealand. Um, and then I think Singapore comes sort of closely after that. The countries with the greatest transparency in the world do tend still to be uh, in the western part of the world, but that's changing. Um, and I'm sure if I stand up here in 2024, uh, you'll see uh, a different picture. Uh, in terms of um, the, um, the, the, the in, in terms of um, the World Economic Forum and uh, what they had in terms of ranking of competitiveness, uh, then. Uh, in this region, um, there are quite a number of sort of, you know, competitive uh, countries. Uh, you can see here that the Philippines is ranked fifth amongst the Asian countries, which, which is good. Uh, and that's an improving position uh, that we're seeing. Um, but also, there are a number of countries in the Asia-Pacific region uh, that are competitive. And this is obviously important in terms of drawing in uh, investment. The region is one of the fastest growing regions uh, in the world, and it's likely to continue to be so uh, all the way up to 2020, uh, if you look at some of the projections that have been made. Uh, and this is sort of just judging or just uh, looking at the U uh, USD per capita uh, amounts. But you can see there, uh, China, ASEAN, and India uh, are likely to be the fastest growing um, in the world uh, over the next five years. Uh, it, the, the ASEAN region is the third largest contributor to the Asia-Pacific economies at the moment, uh, representing about 11%. Uh, obviously, the big one is China, um, but ASEAN uh, after Japan. And I, I, I suspect, again, if we were to be here in 10 years looking at these numbers, uh, we would see that uh, ASEAN, who knows, might have even surpassed Japan uh, by then. The... Um, ASEAN um, integration, uh, which is something that's been talked about a lot over the last few, few years. In fact, for the last four years, I've attended the World Economic Forum, uh, which has been in very, the East Asia World Economic Forum, which has been in different parts uh, of this region. 
Um, and the discussion has all been around AEC, uh, and AEC being basically you know, the ASEAN Economic Community Integration. Uh, it set itself uh, a goal, as I'm sure all of you know, to, was to get completely integrated by the end of 2015. That's not going to happen, um, because I think there's just too many, um, too many hurdles, too many difficulties, particularly around, I think, the, f the free flow of capital uh, and the free flow of labor. Uh, and that's probably because of you know the, the, the divergency and disparity in you know where the various different countries are, um, but there, a lot has been done uh, already, um, and um, already you know you can move goods around ASEAN tariff free, um, and that that's that's important. In fact, I was only saying uh, yesterday to somebody that if you buy a Toyota car in Singapore, uh, they will often give you two prices. Uh, they'll give you an ASEAN price for the car that was produced in Thailand, um, and then they'll give you the car price that was produced in Japan. Um, and as cars are so expensive in Singapore, that difference is worth the saving. So uh, it goes into thousands of dollars. So um, you're already seeing some of the benefits. Now, clearly, uh, a company like Toyota, in this case, is going to want to manufacture as many cars as possible in the ASEAN region that it sells in the ASEAN region, so those cars can be more competitively priced. And if you take that across every industry, uh, then you can see the impact uh, that this free flow of trade will have uh, and what it will do in terms of bringing manufacturing in particularly, uh, particular into the ASEAN region. So uh, the goal is to integrate the 10 economies uh, around services, people, capital, um, and manufacturing. Um, and it's making sort of good inroads. And I think it's about 85% uh, through its achievements. Uh, its impact, uh, the estimate uh, by uh, ASEAN is that it will produce 14 million new jobs in the manufacturing and service sector. Um, I'm not sure how they get exactly 14 million, but it, it, I guess the, the, the message is it's a big number um, and a significant number. Um, and those extra jobs uh, will be, um, need to be placed in some sort of real estate, whether it's an industrial building, uh, whether it's in a uh, a hotel, uh, whether it's in an office building, uh, or whether it's in uh, retail or a BPO uh, facility. So um, more jobs, uh, more people. Uh, in terms of the output, uh, then it's expected that uh, the economy, because of uh, what's happening in ASEAN, will grow from its current size of 2.4 trillion uh, to as much as 8 trillion by 2025. And whilst ASEAN has 8% uh, currently of the global popul world population, uh, it only has about 3% of global GDP. Um, so there's, it, it's boxing below its weight in terms of the number of people. So uh, there is the opportunity there. And of course, you know, 600 million people and growing, uh, and particularly young people, uh, will be enterprising and be able to drive growth. So. The opportunities that we see from you know, what's happening in ASEAN at the moment for the real estate market, um, one is you know, more people. Um, so that, that growth is expected uh, to go from the current uh, 624 million uh, in the next five years to 665 million. Um, that's a big growth here in the Philippines. Uh, that growth is expected, if I've got the numbers right, to be about 10% or 10 million. Um, and more people mean more real estate. Uh, more people mean more homes, uh, more offices, more factories uh, for those people to be in. Um, so it's very positive for the real estate market. And certainly one of the drivers for real estate uh, is population growth. The other is the, um, the age of people in ASEAN. Uh, the region is one of the uh, youngest, uh, or has one of the youngest populations uh, in the world. Uh, you, can, you can see here um, from all the various different uh, ages. Um, and you know, here in the Philippines, uh, it has one of the youngest populations in the ASEAN region, and one of the youngest um, populations in the world at 23, point, uh, 23 years. Uh, which is incredibly young. And even going out five years, that's aging only very slightly. So what do sort of young people mean? Well, young people, they change household formation. So young enterprising people, 
Um, the young generation tend to want to go out there and make their way uh, on their own. Um, so when we were growing up, we stayed at home and lived with our parents for the maximum period of time. Uh, some of us still live with our parents because that's the tradition to do so after we get married. Um, but younger people today are different. You know, they want to get into the property market. They want their independence. They want their own homes. No matter how small they are, they still want their own homes. So uh, we're going to see an increase in the household formation because of young people. So an increase from the population, but also an increase from household formation. Um, and also the young people will disrupt the world that we live in today uh, and things will be done differently. Um, so shopping will be different, so that will have an impact. You know, technology, um, young people will be con more conscious of the environment uh, than my generation are. Um, so they will put pressure on property developers uh, to be green and sustainable. Um, they will occupy office buildings differently. Um, they're not probably striving for the corner office uh, that we all did when we started our career, people my generation, because they're mobile. Um, they don't need to work in the office, they can work in multiple places. The office is just one alternative of where these young people can work. They can work at home, on an aeroplane, in the park, in a coffee shop, um, because they're mobile. Um, so we're going to see a lot of changes, um, and those changes will be more pronounced here in Southeast Asia than almost anywhere else in the world because of this young population. So I, I am lucky to have five children who are all very young, and uh, I sort of um, learn an awful lot from them when I sit down with dinner and find out what's happening in, in the other world. Um, so I'm, I, I consider myself lucky to have five consultants uh, at home that can help me understand what's happening tomorrow. Uh, and hopefully I'll be wise enough to be able to take advantage of their foresight and vision, so, uh, uh, or at least helping our clients do. do. Um, urbanization, um, th this has driven the Chinese economy uh, over the past three decades. Um, and it drove other economies uh, as well in the past and it's having a big impact here in the Philippines. Uh, it will continue, uh, and the estimates are there'll be 40 million more people in the next four years in the ASEAN region living in cities. Uh, what does that mean? Well, on the basis of what we talked about, more people, it's gonna be more people in cities, um, which means that those 40 million people need to be accommodated in homes, uh, there'll be jobs, uh, in those cities, they'll want to spend in those cities. Um, so there's going to be a you know a huge change. Um, so land values in the urban area are unlikely to fall um, because of this great movement of people from the countryside into the cities. Um, and I think still in China, uh, over the same period, five years, they're still projecting there'll be another 100 million people that will urbanize in China, and we've got about 40 million. Uh, here in ASEAN. So um, I often drive around city centers in ASEAN and I see, you know, these single story structures um, between sort of larger high rise buildings. Um, and you just know that, you know, the advice that you give to those people is hold on to that land because it's going up in value. So, um, and um, you can hold on as long as you want, it's still going to go up in value. So, uh, because, you know, the pressure on cities will continue. Um, what also oh, is helping, uh, ha um, happening, um, the expansion of the middle income uh, group, uh, and that will continue uh, over the next five years here in the Philippines. Uh, they're, they're projecting a 51% increase in the number of people that uh, come into this ca category. Currently, uh, it's 19 million, and they're uh, suggesting that will grow to almost 30 million people. Um, and you can see the same trend uh, across the region. Uh, and it's more pronounced, of course, in less developed countries. Here in, Cam you know, in Cambodia, you can see uh, the growth is expected to be as high as 170%. So what, what does this mean? Um, basically, um, what this means uh, is that uh, there's going to be an increase in consumption. Uh, with this rising wealth, there'll be an increase in consumption. Uh, and that certainly will have an impact on uh, retail space, and just here you can see uh, some of the ASEAN countries uh, that we've highlighted where there's going to be increase in retail space. But the, the other thing that it will impact uh, on is the housing market. 
um, because housing markets are driven by affordability. Uh, it's you know how much we can save and how much we can afford to pay the bank back. So with rising uh, incomes, uh, then you will see house prices rise as well. Now, of course, uh, house prices can be affected by supply. Um, so you can get moments where the supply dries down prices or stops them going up. But I don't think there is a residential property market in the world where real incomes are going up and the residential market prices are going down. It, it just really doesn't happen that way. So the trend will be um, for uh, house prices to rise as well. And then if you put everything else into the mix around urbanization, population growth as well, you can see where, uh, where things uh, are likely to head. Um, what's happening in the sort of retail scene? Um, you can see that uh, there are um, sort of retail malls uh, uh, emerging. Uh, here in the Philippines, uh, you uh, have your fair share uh, of sort of you know, world-class retail, um, some of the biggest in the world. I think you've got two, two of your shopping centers uh, in the top 10 uh, in the world and uh, one also the largest uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, so, and there's a change also in the, you know, formation of what's happening um, with the retail. There's a lot more integrated uh, type developments whereby with the urbanization that's going on and people uh, living in the city and young people uh, want to be, uh, wanting to be out and about, that we're seeing integrations of retail, housing and office um, all coming together. Uh, as sort of communities, small communities that are, are being built. So uh, I think that will uh, continue as well. So that, that's um, just a sort of broad overview, and I hope there's a few things that resonated there that, uh, about uh, what uh, we see as uh, the opportunities that are coming through the growth uh, of the ASEAN region. Um, what, what I'd like to sort of touch on uh, now, if I may, is um, just an update uh, on you know, what's happening in uh, the ASEAN real estate market. The indicators in Southeast Asia, most uh, of the markets uh, are up. You can see there are some down here in terms of rentals. Uh, in Singapore, uh, the economy slowed down a bit uh, and we're seeing uh, a supply of office space coming in, which is cooling the market a bit. Um, but other markets you can see here, you know, by and large uh, are moving up. But the capital markets remain strong whilst interest rates uh, are low because of the returns that you can get in real estate, which I mentioned. And some of the interesting parts about uh, markets like Japan and Australia um, and Singapore is that the cost of debt uh, is very low and below the yield uh, that the rent is giving you on, on the real estate. Um, so you, what you're doing is you're getting a return, not just on um, the equity portion that you put in, but also you're getting a return on the, um, on the debt part as well. So you can go into the Tokyo office market um, and your cash on cash returns can be as high as seven or 8%. So even though the yield on the uh, property that you buy might only be 4% when you enter the market, because debt servicing costs are as low as 1% in Japan, um, if you go in there and you leverage up, you get a return on uh, your, your, your debt, and you also get a return on your equity as well. So it can give you an enhanced yield. Uh, and here also in the Philippines, uh, I think the gap between uh, yields and debt servicing costs is about 2%. So you can do the same here. Um, and that's why real estate is you know, uh, so attractive um, and why we continue to see investment into the real estate industry um, because of that, because the enhanced returns on your equity um, have, been in, uh, have been improved because of debt. Uh, office rents uh, are uh, expected uh, in Asia Pacific to rise, uh, but rise maybe more moderately. Uh, we've seen some big increases here in places like Jakarta, um, and also the Philippines have seen some increases and um, in, in Manila here. Uh, but you can see by and large, uh, many of the markets have seen sort of rental growth. And the outlook for rents, uh, we've, uh, we've got growth here in uh, Manila, uh, and then some of the other markets uh, we're expecting just to ease off a little bit over the next 12 months 
uh, which is mainly driven by supply. Uh, and capital values, uh, they tend to follow trends in rents. Um, so we're uh, seeing some sort of rises there uh, in capital values, but you can see that there's some um, sort of eaving off because of the rentals. Um, and office market, the capital values you can see here are expected to continue to rise in Manila, um, but some pressure on them in the region. Um, so the summary uh, there uh, is, you know, what I touched on, I think, earlier, uh, population, rising income, uh, you know, the formation of 600 million people um, will all bear, uh, bear well for the real estate market. Um, and that's it. I um, think I had some other slides on BPOs, but they're not up here for some reason. But maybe, you know, we can talk about sort of BPOs um, when we open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you.